Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to the PAC uh, Photographic Arts Council Los Angeles discussion. Um, Bailey is is fine. She's just a little under the weather today, so I have subbed in for her just this one time. She'll be back soon. Um, thank you so much for being here. The Photographic Arts Council is pleased to welcome um, Buck Ellison and Will Jarvis today. Um, first of all, I wanted to just direct you to our website, which is packlosangeles.com and uh, our Instagram, which is Photographic Arts Council LA. Um, please visit our website. If you are new to PAC, you can sign up for our mailing list there. Follow us on Instagram to learn about all the cool things that we're doing. Um, so with that said, I will make a quick intro here. Um, thank you gentlemen for being with us. Buck Ellison received BA in German literature from Columbia University in New York and an MFA from this. Oh, Lord, I didn't think to pronounce this in advance. Buck, how do you pronounce this? It's impossible. Städelschule. Okay, thank you. 2014. I apologize. I just, I think I can read. Uh, borrowing from the language of stock photography, Ellison produces meticulously detailed images that examine white American wealth. His large format photographs portraying Ivy League students, wasp dynasties and affluent homes are inspired by 17th century Dutch paintings, specifically family portraits that display an intricate set of coded signifiers and a particular attention to detail. Overall, his tableau showcase in vivid detail the mechanisms that quietly, even politely obscure inequality in America. Olsen has exhibited his work at Valise Hertling, Paris, Carl Kostel, Malmo, Sweden, uh, the Sunday Painter in London, Kunsthal Wien in Vienna, an index, the Swedish Contemporary Art Foundation in Stockholm, Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio, and Museum for Modern Kunst Frankfurt. I apologize <laughs> for my pronunciations. Um, we're very pleased to have also with us Will Jarvis, uh, who is the co-founder and director of the South London Gallery, The Sunday Painter, and he is joining us from London today. So thank you for giving us your, your evening. Uh, no worries. 2009, the Sunday Painter started as an artist-run project space for showing the works of friends and peers, became a commercial gallery in 2014. The gallery's origins are reflected in its commitment to running an artist-first space and cultivating a program that continually confronts questions and evolves with itself and the world around us. Sounds like a good mission to me. Um, I was very uh, excited to read this morning's news that Buck has been awarded the um, first photo book prize from Perry Photo and Aperture. So congratulations, that's wonderful news. And we're very pleased to be, uh, to hear from you today. Um, he's also uh, featured in Made in LA at the Hammer, which is at the Hammer and the Huntington this year. We shall see how it evolves, whether we can go in, in person, but in the meantime, you can check out the Hammer's website and they're doing some programming as well um, around Made in LA. So that's uh, very exciting. A lot of great developments for, for us here in LA. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, Buck has some images to share with us. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Thanks for inviting me and for tuning in everyone. And yeah, Will, it's late there. So thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure, it's your pleasure. Okay, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna wave goodbye. Um, I'm gonna um, come back at about 12.45 or so, and we can do some Q&A. So direct your questions to the Q&A box and the chat, and um, I'll see you in a bit. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so everyone can see this? Great. Yeah. Um, so today I wanna talk about some images that deal with representations of children. Because I think kids are really interesting. Um, and these are all also included in Made in LA and in that presentation. So you get to see that 
hopefully at some point in person, but until then, uh, we can look at these. Um, so this is the first image. This is a still life. Um, and this is one of the weirdest paintings I've ever seen. And I've been obsessed with it since I was in school. Um, and Will can attest to this, like when we did the show in London. So this painting is in the collection of the Tate Britain. So here it is installed, uh, this image at the hammer. Um, and this is the title of the painting that is reproduced in my work. Um, and Will, I think at one point I was even like, can we try and get this painting in the show? And you were like, no, that's insane. But um, yeah, we, we started hatching a, a, a dangerous plan to, uh, <laughs> to try from the Tate to the gallery at very short notice. But um, some of the more conservative directors decided against what we intended. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how you, you seem to tease out a thread through time and you, you pick things that seem to be very, um, I guess to most people, you, you, we don't notice the importance of, and then you kind of tease out this, this story, this narrative that kind of shows this almost cause and effect. Have you got, a, have you got an image of the painting on its own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it there. It in all its glory. Um, and let me talk a bit about the painting because I think, mm for the first time like I did it's like what is going on here um so this was actually a common theme in British paintings of the time was like these sort of charity pictures so wealthy patrons would commission painters to show their children um with act with sort of like performing acts of charity right like relieving the poor um but here we see it like so vividly described in terms of this boy almost has green skin and then the light falling on their faces and they're both dressed in this sort of expensive fabrics, even the Cocker Spaniel, like a sort of like shiny coat going on there. Um, and I thought it was such a weird painting that I started reading about it. Um, and this is the wall labeled directly from the tape. So maybe Will, you can read this for me. So scenes of rural po poverty and philanthropic kindness were a feature of British art in the latter part of the 18th century. This painting is unusual in featuring identifiable contemporaries rather than generic figures. The well-dressed sitters are the children of Sir Francis Ford, a wealthy plantation owner and politician. Facing calls for the abolition of the slave trade, pro-slavery campaigners would claim that the poor in England live worse lives than slaves. Oh, oh. Uh, sorry, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's okay just made it a little bit harder they live worse <laughs> worse lives than slaves in the west indies the, this painting may very well be intended to draw attention to that idea so it's a bit of propaganda essentially yeah so i reading that and then i read a bit more about it so sir francis ford was a fourth generation jamaican plantation holder and in i think 1776 there were sort of like movements towards abolition in england which would eventually happen so he was sort of really under threat at this point so when he commissioned sir william beachy who was very much part of the academy like um being a sir and all he had a real agenda with this painting um and also sort of using his children um as pawns in this larger campaign um so i thought this was so interesting and i thought that feels sometimes like uh it feels very far away and yet also like a um, these are questions or problems that we still grapple with or i still grapple with as an artist sort of what um leg work does art do for um, people or how can it be harnessed to um, certain objectives uh, so it took me a long time I think I've been trying to put this into a work for like seven years and it always felt so radioactive that I withheld <laughs> from that. Um, but I finally did um, and part of it was spurred on by, of course, this year, I think um, all of us have been thinking about new things, which is great. Um, and I want to just read this um, 
I'm not a historian. I am not an authority on race by any means. I'm an artist, um, but this is a great book and it's a book that I've read. And I think this thesis is really like helpful in terms of what we do now when we look at paintings from this time. Um, you wanna read this too, Will? Just the highlight part. Sure. Um, during the 19th century, the United States entered the ranks of the world's most advanced and dynamic economies. At the same time, the nation sustained an expansive and brutal system of human bondage. This was no mere coincidence. Slavery's capitalism argues for slave, slavery's centrality to the emergence of American capitalism in the decades between the revolution and the civil war. According to editors Sven Beckert and Seth Rockman, the issue is not whether slavery itself was or was not capitalist, but rather the impossibility of understanding the nation's spectacular pattern of economic development without situating slavery as front and center. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's really, uh, that's been a real North Star for me. So, and I think we can, we can apply this system also to England, right? Like this was a, a whole, mm -hmm. system, right? Like we were sending the cotton somewhere to be milled. Um, and I thought, with this, like thinking about situating slavery front and center, then we have to also think about like, who were the people at this time that were commissioning these paintings of their children that I think time has been so kind to, right? Like, I, we, I mean, this one's crazy, but um, we, uh, these are all over our museums. And I think with my work, I'm always interested in like, where is this money coming from or who's paying for this? Um, and I wanted to take that back to this time period. So that's what mm -hmm. lives are trying to do. Um, and then, and then the, the, and the combination of things that you have that, cause obviously often things are kind of symbolic or quite like literal, uh, like reference points for other things, usually connecting to kind of economics or, or yeah, different systems. What, what, and this one, what are the, what are the other parts? So, I mean, this is this vintage bull and bear crane stationery. Um, and stationery and sort of thank you notes already have this sort of implication of being raised a certain way. Um, but then to sort of, uh, that's a nod towards like this entire Western global economy being built on suffering. Um, and then even something as innocuous as a candle, like I was reading, um, they were able to send sperm whale candles from Nantucket and that allowed sugar plantations in the West Indies to operate 24 hours a day. So these things that are just, I mean, it's just a candle. Um, they also point to um, larger patterns in history. Even this is a receipt from Brooks Brothers, which is a really interesting brand. It's clothed all of our presidents. Um, it made uniforms for the Union Army, but then at the same time made clothing for slaves. So it's like, uh, couldn't get more American than that. Um, so that's this work. Um, and then I just want to show you the rest of the sort of still lives, all of which I think deal with similar themes. So they're all looking at paintings that were pulled from this book about um, British children's portraits after the enlightenment. So that was a big shift sort of showing kids as um, free and having childhood being its own time. They weren't just little adults, um, but then also um, looking into each of the individual paintings and sort of researching the families and uh, finding out where where the means came to commission a giant portrait of your children, right? Um, and then, so this one is cufflinks, and this was super fun. It was in, we were able to install it at the Huntington in the permanent collections gallery, um, which was a big push. And props to Dennis Carr, the curator there, for allowing us to do this. Um, but this is really fun. So the Copley painting here on the right was a direct inspiration for this sort of a uh, Rayburn painting that's represented in my work uh, that was made three years later. So you can see the sort of formal similarities between the two. Um, mm -hmm. Two brothers, two 
emphasis on the outdoor and then um, sort of ironically like these humanist idea or ideals of being um, invested in um, the well-being of all mankind and yet the person that commissioned this was um, a massive slaveholder. Uh, but then I also wanted to sort of implicate with all the work, I think it's really important to implicate myself in these discussions. So thrown in with this one are all these New York Times wedding announcements that I um, applied for with all my ex-boyfriends. So they know who they are, <laughs> they're in here. Um, but uh, I th um, and what about things like the tennis balls or the, or the roses? Do those have specific kind of symbolism within this work? Really, like, I think that's also really important to maintain. Like, again, not a historian. I, I really wanted to just talk about this. I should have written about it. And what I love about photography or artwork in general is it allows me to ask questions I don't have answers to, right? So some things are just formal. It's a still life. Tennis balls move our eyes around. Flowers are nice. Um, there's no yeah, and also, I guess it creates, there's a certain rhythm that you bring to the work that, you know, I do think that there's this relationship that I think one of the things you're very good at is that you're good at kind of bringing the viewer in. You're dealing with very difficult topics and things that, you know, are often very painful to really look at and you are looking at them, but you, you bring this in through this um, subtle almost often seductive route so we're, we're there with you because we're engaged with the you know particularly this piece of rhythm of the work and the composition and some of the palette those things are quite seductive and then we're kind of met with these other subtler like inroads into these topics that you're you know delving into you're excavating thank you yeah i um that's really nice i um i hope that that is coming through <laughs> Because I think that's also for me a real tension. Like I really love these paintings from this time, and then to, as a viewer, just to realize, like, oh God, like this is the apparatus behind all this beauty. Like that's a that's a thing to reckon with. Um, so Massively. There's five still lives in this series. Oh, and the the background colors are all based on the wall colors of the Huntington, which are probably also sort of based on uh, British interiors from the time of these paintings. Uh, mm. This guy has shallots in it, some flaky sea salt. This was my grandmother's crystal, a dog collar. Um, this one's sort of fun. So this is, um, Josiah Wedgwood was actually like a, a massive abolitionist, like a really cool guy, the Wedgwood porcelain. So these are, Wedgeland porcelain plates from my college, which is also so strange, this idea that like a college would produce plates uh, <laughs> a lot about sort of like their expectations for the sort of life that you might live. Um, <laughs> and then Geo Group is a sort of notorious private prison contractor. Um, and this is their financial statements report. Um, and I do think there's definitely a connection between this out of sight, out of mind thing, right? Like these um, British people where slavery was illegal in England, yet you were able to have massive estates in the West Indies, people suffering in them. And I think we're doing, there might be a connection there between sort of what's happening in our prison industrial complex and how it's not visible to the general public. Um, maybe. Uh, here's some lacrosse balls. Again, a thank you note. This one is mine. I wrote when I was like, I don't know. It's all messed up. So hopefully young. Um, and then this little guy, we'll come back to him. These are these commemorative George Bush senior stamps um, that just came out. I may have been the only person that bought them in LA. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so that brings me sort of to the next project. Unless, is there anything else to say? No, I, th I think, that, yeah, I think you covered it. Um, I mean, each of those, it feels like each of those needs their own, you know, each still life very much has its own explanation. There's there's five of them in the show. Um, but yet as a taste for what they are, I think it, it is good to move on to daughters and talk some about that body of work, because also that's 
the, 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 what you've teased out of that is really remarkable and kind of terrifying. Yeah, buckle up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Otters is the title of a body of work that's made up of six photographs I made in 2016. Um, and it was all shot during a single girls lacrosse game at two boarding schools in Connecticut, or one boarding school, but between two Connecticut boarding schools. Um, and the connection to Bush Sr. Um, was that generations of this sort of dominant class of Americans have been educated at similar schools. The Bushes went to Andover, um, but they would have played Taft and Hotchkiss in sports. Um, and with these, I was really interested in how a Native American spiritual ritual became this like predominantly white, affluent East Coast sport. Um, how that happened and what a strange sort of, uh, that can tell us a lot about America. Um, so these are all, this is like, I guess the only photographs I've ever made that aren't staged and yet it's a highly ritualized sport with rules and costumes. Um, some of which sort of have this ghostly reminder of the Native Americans who played it before, right? So ribbons in the hair, or sometimes there's a braids or things like that. Um, chanting. Um, maybe we'll come back to these, but, and then this is the installation of just one of the works was shown at the Huntington. Um, but it's big. It's really important to me that they be really large and monumental. Um, yeah, I thought it was really cool to show girls being violent and strong and having agency. And not that they don't, but like, I feel like that representation is often. Yeah, like, I mean that's like that one in particular by men. Yeah, it's almost like a war cry. This one, you can like it's fierce. It's great. She's cool. Um, yeah. And they're really badass. I have a lot of respect for these girls and their athleticism. And I mean, a lacrosse ball, if you haven't held one, is really hard rubber. So that flying at your face at 60 miles per hour with no pads. Um, and all they really have are these uh, things that sort of protect their eyes, like, um, is a lot more hardcore, in my opinion, than the male version of the sport where you wear pads. It's a bit more like American football. Um, and I chose Girls Across because it is supposed to be closer to its Native American ancestors. So uh, the type on this is insane. I'm sorry about that. I don't, I don't know what happened. Um, but let's bear with me here. Delve in a bit more. Pardon? But for me, Buck, I was just going to say that the, 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 the bit about this that really gets me the most that I find kind of um the most mind-blowing and, and kind of horrifying is the fact that the correlation between you know this uh, this nation of people being wiped out and the growing scarcity of the materials the equipment required to play the game because the experts were being decimated who actually you know the people producing these things were being decimated and then that also going into the rise of becoming like this you know, um, the desire of it or the elite, the elite nature of it growing at the same, it's almost like a, they're in relations and that's, that's a, you know, that's still a terrifying thing that I guess we kind of in some senses have today. Scarcity, regardless of what it's born of, is still a really powerful and potent force in the world, but it's, it's almost like snipped away from its, the, the true horror of it in a way. Totally. Um... It's a it, Perverse story. Yeah, so let me just, if you guys don't know about lacrosse, I didn't know anything about it until I started researching this. Um, but, and this is broad strokes, it's a very complex and messy history. So this is um, by no means authoritative, but certain tribes nicknamed it the little brother of war. And it was initially used to practice for combat. Um, and the Iroquois nation, which was the tribe I was most interested in because they occupied what is now Connecticut where the schools are, used hide and wood to make these really beautiful sticks to play 
the game with that Will's talking about. Um, and we get the name, and this is also, I think, really important in terms of our entire perception of this sports history, because indigenous tribes had mostly oral traditions is all through the lens of Europeans, right? So like, this was made by a British person, um, or even the name um, Lacrosse's, like refers to the bishop's staff. Um, and so then in the, around the 1700s, we have these schools propping up to train ministers, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and then with that it sort of necessitated schools to uh, prepare students to go there, high schools. Um, and that leads us to, I chose to shoot at these two schools, Hotchkiss and Taft, because of their relationship to this history. So Hotchkiss was founded by um, also sort of an amazing woman, but the ex-wife of, um, can't remember his name, but Mr. Hotchkiss, and he was a massive, I mean, they made everything, staplers, cars, but a big thing that they made was weaponry, and they were sort of like on the Winchester level, and so Hotchkiss revolving cannons were used to decimate populations at the Battle of Wounded Knee, for example, um, and then the Taft family, similar to the Bushes, are sort of this American political dynasty you see here, what do we have? One president, two senators, two representatives, attorney general, secretary of wars, etc. cetera. Um, and so that was a pointed choice to use those two. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't want to go forward. Uh -oh. um, yeah, and then like Will was saying, so with this population declining, there were not many people available to make the sticks that were required to play the sport. Um, and so that made it expensive and elite and um, appealing to uh, this population. I do wanna say, and this is not represented in my project, my project's a lot, focusing a lot on the sort of absence of, um, indigenous people. Um, so you'll see a couple of the images are back focused. So I wanted also to focus on the land that was taken. Um, so, you know, this school is on 300 acres of beautiful land in the center of Connecticut that belonged to someone else before. Um, and there is also, this is I think important to say, but like lacrosse still exists as an indigenous tradition um, played sort of in the forest, longer games, um, but the sort of codified lacrosse that most of us think of um, definitely comes out of this lineage from these schools. What else? I think that might be it. So these guys are massive. They're like, I think they're my height, so they're 6'4". Um, and are we missing anything, Will? No, I think that's good. And I, yeah, the, the kind of... Um... Yeah, the anthropometric, the fact that they are like, they're meeting us, they're a bit bigger than us because they're hung high. You know, there is this like, there's, I guess I feel like you, it's hard to talk about your work because there's actually so much that goes on behind the scenes. And I know from, I feel like you re research every different element involved and even the relationship between like women in positions of power and men in positions of power and the relationship between who did sport and which kind of sport and how actually now these it's also that like brought into almost like the boardroom like <laughs> it goes I don't know it's I think those elements are also very interesting yeah that was cool so someone who wrote an essay or at GAT talks about how I think it was like 95 percent of female CEOs played organized sports um and the sort of language of sports like teamwork leadership etc captain uh often spills over into corporate America um and yeah, even like, so this project took me, I think, six years to realize. Um, and it was obviously really hard to get the permission to shoot at the schools. And the only way I was able to do that was through art world connections. So I can't tell you the amount of people when we showed these in Basel who came up and were like, I went to that school, I played lacrosse there. Um, <laughs> so that's always fun for me too, to sort of like mirror back um, the world in which these Im images circulate. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess it's always kind of tricky because you're 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 handling something that's that's it's it's a very acute and it's whether like there's different ways that your work could be read, but it's whether or not people kind of hopefully tune into the ways that I guess you're 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 wanting them to in some senses. Um, but yeah, I guess there's also those it you and it functioning within this other economy of the art world it, it adds like a strange meta layer to what you're doing because you're you the same world that you're looking at this world of privilege is the same world that these works also exist in, in for the most is. part broad strokes i mean we're talking about an art fair uh so that yeah. is self-selecting but uh yeah it's interesting so Matt's daughters, and yeah, and the title for the project, I, I liked thinking about, um, you know, these are the children of powerful people, and, but also to show these women with their own agency and power, and, you know, it's, I don't know anything about the, their actual parents, um, but that was important. Also with the, it ties to Little Brother of War a little bit there. Um, mm. I hope this lets us go forward. Cool. All right, so this brings us to the last body of work about kids that's shown in this presentation. Um, are we good on time? Yeah, I think we're, I think, yeah, we've got a good pace. This is good. We're okay. I don't know how to tell time. So we're, uh, okay. we're okay. this is the last work. Um, and this is Dick, Dan, Doug. Oh, it's missing, Doug. Sorry. The Everglades Club, Palm Beach, Florida is also missing. 1990, 2019. Um, and that's this work. Here it is in its entirety, the title. Um, so, it's, so just, I just think I'm going to, just to clarify. So it's based, it's made in 20, 2020, 2019. Yeah. But it's based in 1990. Yeah. So that's part of this kind of restaging that you've been doing of like key times within the lives of the DeVos family. Right, so here we see the three sons of Richard DeVos Sr. Um, and the DeVos family founded Amway, which is short for American Way, which, um, Will, you might be a, the authority on this now after the podcast, but it's, <laughs> Uh, since the 70s been in like heated legal battles with um, the Chamber of Commerce in terms of whether or not it's a pyramid scheme. Um, and any way you slice it, I think that the business model really is focused on targeting people who are really desperate economically and driving them further into the debt with the idea that by buying Amway seminars and Amway products and selling them to other people that you can improve your life. And if you fail to do that, it's your fault and you're an idiot, essentially. So um, again, I think there's, it was, uh, I have really like no issue with people being wealthy per se, but I, I do I sort of take issue with um, this means of acquiring it. It's pretty, gnarly the stuff you hear about what the family has done um, so this is one image from a larger body of work which looks at so these are the three brothers and then one of them married betsy prince elizabeth prince the older brother of eric prince she's currently our u.s secretary of education he's the former ceo of blackwater the Again, hotly contested uh, mercenary firm. He's now working on cobalt mining and priming, training private uh, armies in China. Um, and all of these are imaginings of a family that I became interested in uh, because of this is insulation, the sort of opacity of their public presence, right? Like, besides her holding political office right now, like, They've been very, very active in our government for generations. And yet the only information that's really available about them comes like from their philanthropic foundations. Um, so 
what was cool is when Betsy took office, she was required to disclose her financial holdings. Um, and that was 170 pages PDF that we went through. And that is was written about in the Wall Street Journal as being this rare glimpse into how a family of that caliber uh, structures their assets. And we never get to see that. Um, and that I thought was so fascinating. Also this sort of, um, we'll get back to this math, it's too much. So that's <laughs> part one. And then part two was I had this meeting at Vanity Fair and I was telling them about the DeVos project and they were telling me they had written this article in 2018 about the family and they refused to respond or have like any, so they had to commission these like not so great, I would say, uh, paintings of the family. So this is Betsy and Eric with their parents. And then this is Dick and Dick um, with Helen DeVos. Um, so I thought, wow, that's so crazy at this point. Like we have billions of images made every day and yet we have no images of this family. Um, so I thought I'd do the next best thing and cast people models and actors find locations and props based on research to sort of extrapolate a fiction that hopefully can reveal some form of truth right um so we don't know anything about what the brothers are actually like in their private lives um they only appear giving speeches or donating money um but Oh, and then this is this is sort of like cemented it all for me. So this is a photo. This is uh, next to Reagan there on the left is Rich DeVos Sr. And then there's photos of every single president since then, either with him or giving a speech on Amway's behalf. Um, with the exception of Obama just didn't, he didn't do anything, but he didn't give an Amway speech. Um, so if you need any more convincing about their level of influence. Um, <laughs> could, uh, could you, again, I'm, I'm going to be, because um, I'm here to push just no, how kind please. of detail I think the works. You would, in the family portrait, I remember we were speaking about, you could kind of delve into some of the details that you had. I remember you saying one thing about the girls, you know that they go swimming, that you'd even gotten the models to kind of tint their hair a little bit as if they've been exposed to like swimming pool um uh chemicals yeah yeah so this guy um we had a couple of yearbook photos and that's what i used to cast them um but yeah so i knew that they were all competitive swimmers so i worked this incredible printer and we tinted their hair like a little bit green um uh these are books from a major thinker in their faith, um, they're Christian Reformed Dutch, which is a, a pretty hardcore sect of Protestant Christianity. Um, so they're, she's holding like a hymnal from their church. And then I knew they went to Holland Christian school, but I knew that they didn't have uniforms, but they probably had a dress code. So this was sort of a, a guess as to what that may look like. Um, Eric here is holding these lead soldiers that he made with his father. Um, he has a nautical belt on. I know that sailing is really important for the family. Um, and with the brothers, for example, in this golfing photo, um, this was the image we used to find for the location. So I tried to get that sort of sunset thing going on, which I think we did okay with. Um, and so, also talking about the years, so the, what, what year is the family portrait? This is 75. And then it's a, is it a decade on when she, Betsy's pregnant on the phone? Yes. And then what I also loved is the fact that you've dressed her partner up almost in the same clothes as her little brother is wearing in the family portrait. And I think the idea of like alluding to the reciprocal nature and this this like you know small group shared values 
and the perpetuation of this and solidification of this like power that that is you know it's it's contingent on people being in you know again the ivy league and the and the lacrosse and it's it's there's subtle class things woven in everywhere that are that are again part of keeping the structure in a within set hands essentially true so when she married when the princes and the bosses married their eldest offspring to one another it was called the wedding of the century by the local newspapers um and it really was uh a merging of two families of yeah shared faith and shared um political aspirations absolutely um and again, a, a private moment with Betsy, like despite her faith, she I think is really interesting because she is, any way you slice it, like a very impressive, um, motivated, strong woman. And I wanted to show her sort of leaning into someone on the phone because um, in public, she always appears as sort of confused and polite. And I think that that's a smoke screen, but we'll never know. Uh, <laughs> Just one other thing about, so Instagram weirdly, despite it being like pretty closed off, like their children post a lot of photos of them on Instagram. So this is Dick Jr. Um, so I had like a sort of rough idea how they might dress um, based on the grandchildren's Instagram. I know what the golf course looks like. And then I know they're obsessed with foxes because DeVos means the fox in Dutch. So. This is from her um, disclosure of holdings. Um, and there's lots of shell corporations and LLCs with sort of Fox illusions in them. Uh, so we threw in, you can't even really see it, unfortunately, but this is a, a Fox golf head cover. I think that's what they call it. Um, this little guy, he's cute. And then just one note about the urine. It is not real. It was a lot of work. Um, it is actually bags of green tea, these sort of catheter bags filled up with green tea. And then this is my assistant sort of testing it out to see if it looked real. Um, and then we ended up shooting it from behind, which I think has worked out a little better. Um, yeah. And then I think that's it. I mean, this stuff's fun. This is from the Wall Street Journal, but just this structuring of assets, all of which is completely legal um, and not uncommon. There's nothing categorically wrong here, um, but it's just interesting to see how money moves around so quietly in the background and where it's going, what it's doing. Um, and I, yeah, if this somehow missed this, like the DeVosses are one of the major political Republican family donors. So when Betsy leaves office, that's by no means like the end of her career. That's probably just the beginning. So. Hmm. Scary stuff. Well, interesting. I'm back. Thank you so Bye. much for that presentation. Um, yeah, I hope that was not too miserable. It's a lot of info. No, 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 no. Um, I, so please, everyone who's watching, um, type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat and we will, um, we will, we will ask them. Um, I have a question about the installation. You have um, a couple of slides ahead. Um, you're using this wall that's kind of looks like a fence. Yes. Yeah. Um, this was very exciting. So this was a decision of the curators, Lauren Mackler, um, Ike and Miriam Ben Salah, um, but they, in two spaces in the hammer installation, wanted to use the sort of exposed wall. And I think they were really interested in it in relationship to my work in terms of like transparency and opacity. So the portrait of Betsy as a kid is what's hanging on this wall. Um, and then you can sort of see then like also the back of the frame there. Yeah, that's cool. So we do have a couple of, a few questions coming. A few congratulations to you on your award this morning. Oh, thank you so much. I saw that. I don't know how to respond <laughs> to that, but thank you. I appreciate that. Enjoy it, enjoy it. 
Um, so question, uh, were all of the still lives that the hammer and the Huntington made recently? I think you mentioned that what, that the Huntington pieces were actually inspired by work in the Huntington. Is that right? They were. So I made still lives in grad school. So between like 2014 and 2016. Um, and then when I moved here, I sort of was like, oh, I can do the same thing, but with models. Um, and then, yeah, these were in partially a response to our situation. So it became more difficult to work with models. So I went back to still lives and that was a real, really nice to return to them. That's great. That's great. Um, do you, who do you consider your influences as an artist? And the name Tina Barney has come up. Love Tina, she's the coolest. I finally got to meet her. Um, She's incredible. She's a real like scholar of painting too. I think sometimes that gets lost in uh, talking about her work, but she's so smart and she's, uh, yeah, like no one really, one thing, this is something we talked about, but what I really admire about her work is sort of, it also acknowledges like as a white Western artist, like I think without wanting to, you're really sort of imprinted by these paintings that you see um, and how that even as a photographer really influences these decisions that we think are subjective or uh, intuitive but are I think actually sort of our eyes have been trained a certain way. Mm -hmm. Tina's the best. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you had any reaction from the DeVos family? No. No. I no. would love I would love <laughs> all the more work. Um, why, why the interest in the DeVosses particularly? They're not the only wealthy family around? Well, like I said, I don't, the wealth is not, uh, I, I think it's important as I'm like, the wealth in and of itself isn't a problem. Um, I was interested in them because of their means of acquiring it and how that targeted people who were so vulnerable. And then it was a sort of perfect storm. I mean, it came, well, we did our first show together two years ago and he was so brave. I was like, this is what I really want to do. And it was in England where it's also like, not everyone really knows about this family, um, but there was just so much going on, like their Dutchness, their relationship to um, religion, uh, the fact that there was so little information about them and yet like they were so active behind the scenes. Uh, I thought it's just too good to be true. And I was really, I, I wanna say this and I think like the show we did was called Tender Option but I was also a little off put by just how intense the misogyny was towards her. Like in our public dialogue around her was always like, she's an idiot and she's a witch and she doesn't know anything. And I was like, unfortunately, like, I think she's really smart. And I wanted to look at her family like with a bit more nuance and take some more time. Yeah, the, the title tender option was like, it's a kind of, it was a kind of tender treatment of the subject. And even though you, it felt like you had, you conflicted with, what she stood for and what you potentially stood for it was also ha handled and dealt with in this way that just felt it had the right tone and I do think in an age when there's such kind of angry polar views I, I think you know when treating a another who has different opinions with a more kind of gentle and slightly softer rendering is is there's some merit there also like they're gonna be fine like God <laughs> really wealthy white people be uncomfortable for one moment, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is an interesting question from Dylan Sherman. Um, he says, can you speak more uh, about the recirculation of these images of privilege within privileged families? Have you seen how wealthy collectors install your work in their homes or how they relate to it? Great question, Dylan. Um, yeah, that is... I feel uh, it's um, it's a lot. It's fun, right, Will? I think it's, to me, I'll let you talk about this more, but I haven't seen many images of it, but I love the idea of this sort of silent witness potential for the world, right? That it can just sort of hang there or in that space or- Yeah, I, 
more likely. I have I have heard of one um one Arab collector who's bought a who bought a piece and it's of a it's of a, like a, a this re this rendering of a very white family and this very white presentation. And I think he really enjoys the kind of the play on that, like the kind of this inversion of like a dynamic that's been kind of shoved. Um, so I think you know it's people are yeah people are. I, there's no one buying it who's not aware of what's really being said i think you know yeah it's not. but it's i mean it's also interesting like it's been fun it was fun to have it go to china and go into chinese homes and things like that like that's sort of exciting mm. um there are a handful of questions here that i'll just consolidate about future uh do you have future projects in mind or things that are in the works now more unstaged work or additional staged work or what, what do you have in the hopper kind of? I legally can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. Well, that's intriguing. <laughs> we'll have to remain, we'll have to stay tuned. Yeah, there's some stuff. We, you just can't say what it is, but there are things, there's some very good things. I'm not trying to be cagey. I, I just, I'm not allowed to say anything. Okay. All right. There's your answer. Um, we have some questions about your process. Like how long do you spend setting up a photo? Like uh, from Michael Hall, he's asking about the, the putting green photo. Like what's your, what's your process like? Uh, a long time. So one thing I just sort of try to use against myself is time. So if I'm, still thinking about an idea a couple of years later um that seems to vet it and then the production of this image it probably took six months weirdly the golf course was really hard to get um it was really hard initially to find someone who was going to show their dick because i thought it'd be funny with like having the dick out with dick and then we we ended up not using the dick but that took forever um it yeah, so it's often like a couple of years of thinking, three to six months of like active production. Um, the shoot itself, I like to shoot for a long time. So this shoot was probably four hours. Um, and then editing is another, I mean, ideally six or six months. It's, it takes a while to find the right one. And I always want there to just be one image um, with this kind of thing. Hmm. Um, and That's then Thinking about for a single image to crystallize this idea rather than a series. Yeah, with mm -hmm. this work, I mean the the lacrosse. It felt like it was such a ritual, and it was such a um, the you know the set time of the match was important to represent. So there, I wanted to have the six images. Okay. Um, Neil Flynn asks about what you share with your with your models and your, the others who are involved in the shoot, are they part of the, of the idea or are they just, are they there as your sort of a tool for you to use? Uh, definitely not a tool. So everyone's aware of- I was like, as soon as I said that, I'm like, that's the no, wrong no, 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 that's, it's, <laughs> okay. I mean, that there is something and yeah, I really admire these actors, their openness and willingness to participate in this stuff. like. Doing the shoots, well, this may not surprise you, like asking people to pee on a thing like that makes me really uncomfortable. The subject matter is uncomfortable. So that people are willing to be part of it is a real honor. Um, it has changed a bit. Like I, it's getting, uh, I've had more people who sort of seem like they sort of know what I'm trying to do or, and then they, uh, they seem excited, but it goes both ways. Like the last, um, I shot some newer Betsy stuff with an older Betsy and the woman that we shot was like, really loved Betsy DeVos. It was a Republican and I was like, that's great. Like, cool. How oh, fun for her. If, uh, maybe potentially. Um, a question about lacrosse. Do you see artistry in the game of lacrosse? Like, like the beautiful game. Uh, the play strategies, the images of emotion. This is from G. Freeman. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, Marjorie Ornston asks uh, if you can talk about the book Living Trust, the editing and the sequencing process. Can a bit. I'm talking about it on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but that was a is a fun opportunity. I met Lewis and Sarah from Loose Joints, the publishers through Will. Uh, I think they came to my, our opening, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And you know, when I do exhibitions, it's normally sort of like a um, our show in London, for example, had like one still life, and then some of these DeVos works, and then like a sort of smaller um, image of a, a stock certificate. So to with the book we decided to make chapters and really like I had never thought of the work that way um before beyond like I knew I was making work about Betsy Voss and I knew I was making work about lacrosse but like to really put it all uh in discrete chapters was exciting um and that um I, I loved it it's a sort of very traditional photographic approach that I had never you know I never like studied photography I always went to like fine art school. So that it was interesting to sort of pull it back into that and see what that did. Um, someone is asking, Anita is asking about sharing work in the Northeast sort of in this area versus in other places. And if, is the response different? Do you have different feelings about, about being in those different spaces? I haven't really had the opportunity. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would love to show it like in Connecticut, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but again, like there was a lot of Connecticut in Basel, so. <laughs> sure, for sure. Um, how about, can you just, uh, we're just uh, about out of time here, but I'm curious about your experience with Made in LA. It's such a um, important exhibition at, that the Hammer does regularly and, um, so I'd be interested to hear any thoughts that you had about that show or how that, that process came together. Um, it's just been such an honor the entire way through. Um, we had visits, I think, two or three years ago now. And the visits were really fun and they were really challenging and exciting conversations. And I mean, I am fully aware like what a picture like this with no information looks like and what that does when it circulates. And that is something that sometimes keeps me up at night, but like mm. I make these with my intention, but then they go out into the world. Um, and we talked a lot about that. Uh, and I really just admire Lauren and Miriam for taking the chance on me and giving me the shot. And I know it's not um, by any means easy work to show, so. Right. Well, congratulations on all of this um, attention and success. It's really terrific. Thank you. So um, it's time. The, time. the hour has gone by so quickly. Um, thank you both th uh, so much for, for being part of this. And thank you to everyone for joining. Um, again, check out our, our website and, your, and watch your email inbox for future PAC events. Um, check out the Hammer Made in LA show presently online, I think. And to be determined how the, how we sort of progress and uh, and check out the book as well. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, thanks Will, thank you Buck. We really appreciate you uh, spending your, your Friday with us. Time, thanks for having me and thank you whoever tuned in in the middle of their Friday, that's really nice. And Will, right. hang up. Have a good weekend everyone. <laughs>